Hi everybody, my name is Sierra White and today I will, will be presenting the financial aid presentation. So here are a few housekeeping rules. So everyone will be on mute to avoid background noises. So that helps a lot because a lot of times we have interruptions. And if you have any quick questions, please ask them in the chat and I will get back to you at the end of the presentation. Please note um, the chat questions are public. So when you say information, everybody else will see it and we will have time at the end to answer any questions you might have. So ISAC's mission is to provide Illinois students with information to assist to help make college um, affordable and accessible to all Illinois students. Um, Illinois Student Assistance Commission, we call ourselves ISAC as well. Um, the Illinois Student Assistance Commission is the college access and financial aid agency in the state of Illinois that administers scholarships, grants, prepaid tuition, and student loans and repayment forgiveness programs. And I work for the outreach division at um, ISAC. At, um, we are called the ISAC Corps. So there's around 100 of us across the state of Illinois, and we go around helping uh, parents and students with the whole college going process. So if you need any help in the future with FAFSA or the college going process, please feel free to reach out to me or your ISAC Corps member, Alexis. Okay, so to begin, uh, we're going to talk about college. College is any institution of higher education that awards a degree or credential post, -second, post high school graduation. This includes what is not limited to universities, community colleges, trade schools, and more. So um, the word college can fall under so many different categories. We have vocational schools and trade schools, which can typically take up to two years. So that's your truck driver school, it's electrician, plumbing, or even hair school and then we have an associate's degree that can take up associate's degree we that can take up to two years as well so you can do that at a community college just like you can do a vocational trade school at a, a community college as well and that could be like a nursing degree in with, with your associates so then you could do your bachelor's degree that's about four years so you can get your bachelor's in nursing and the higher degree you have of course the more money you can potentially get in the future and then you have a master's program, which typically takes an additional one to three years after your own, you graduate with your bachelor's. Okay, so what is the value of a college degree? So this is like the example here. So if you have your doctorates, um, you could potentially get up to $1,800 um, a week compared to less than a high school diploma, which you will probably get only $553 a week. So um, this is just basically trying to say the higher degree you have, the more potential of you getting paid more in the future. And then like the unemployment rate is um, less likely to, you're less likely to be unemployed if you have a higher degree. So um, as you can see, if you have less than a high, high school diploma, the unemployment rate is a little, is way higher compared to somebody that has their master's or their doctorate's degree. So um, I know a lot of you guys are planning for college right now. So there's going to be a lot of questions that you might be thinking about right now. So um, here are some questions. So can I afford college? How much will it cost? What is financial aid? What is FAFSA? When and how to do I apply? Where can I get help? So there's plenty of questions out there. So um, hopefully I can answer it by the end of this presentation. So what is financial aid? It is borrowed, given, or earned money that can be obtained from various sources to help pay for college. Uh, financial aid makes college affordable for you. It is intended to make up the difference between, between what your family can afford to pay and what college costs. So if you think you can afford college, think again, because there's so much um, different aid out there that can help you afford college in the future. So here are the different types of financial aid. There um, are many types of financial aid um, out there. So uh, here are a few examples. Um, the funds may be merit-based, need-based, or non-need-based. So right here we have gift aid and self-help aid. So gift aid is typically money that you do not have to pay back. So you shouldn't have to, have to pay back this money, and this money is a gift. So that's why it's called gift aid. So within that, in that we have grants. So Grants are mostly based off um, need base, and that is money that you should not have to pay back to the schools. And then we have our scholarship, so that's money that you actually apply for. So a scholarship you usually apply for, for at different schools or in different um, 
companies, organizations. So that should be free money. You should never be paying for a scholarship. So if you do find a scholarship and it asks you to pay for it, you shouldn't be um, applying for it because why should you have to pay for a scholarship? Okay, so then we have self-help aid. So self-help aid requires a student to take out a little bit more responsibility. Um, so within that we have loans. So loans is the money that you will have to pay back in the future. So that's, that's why it's so important to know um, what loans you take out. And then we have work study. Uh, work study is part of the federal government. Um, it is offered by um, this is your school. So some schools do offer it and some schools do not. Okay, so federal work study, it is a need-based employment program that provides on and off campus jobs to students. Um, you must complete your FAFSA in order to get it. So on a FAFSA, it will ask you, would you like to um, apply for a work study? And I always tell students to press yes, because even if you don't um, want to do the job in the future, it does give you the option to do a work study job. It is a campus-based financial aid program and funds are limited and availability available and available only at participating at and it's available at only participating at institutions. So some schools might have it and some schools might not. And then priority deadlines may apply. So there is um, a time limit on um, when you apply. So I usually recommend students to call their schools and ask them what, um, what federal work study jobs do they offer and ask them when should they apply and what are the deadlines because if all the work study jobs are gone, you cannot do work study for that school year. And the, um, the pay is usually the, min <clears throat> the minimum wage for that school year. And then a student must earn these funds. So this money is not given to you. You must earn it. I had a work study job when I went to Northern Illinois University. I worked at the library. It was, a, it was like my favorite job because um, the library was like simple. I was able to do my homework and study for exams in the library. And it was very flexible with my schedule. Um, and then like my friend, she worked at Walmart and Walmart was not flexible with her schedule at all and did not care that she had like exams or homework. So if you have the choice um, in doing like either a regular job or a federal work study job, I would recommend the federal work study job because it does help with schools because they know school comes first. Um, and I just really enjoyed it. So definitely take advantage of federal work study if you can. And also be aware when you do um, federal work study, like I was offered 1500 for that school year. So make sure you actually put that money towards your balance. Um, Cause I thought, I didn't know that um, you had to tell the financial aid office that you wanted that money towards your actual school balance. Cause if, if you don't, they'll just give you the money in your bank account. So definitely if you want the money to go straight to your ba balance, let the financial aid office at your school know so they can put it directly to your balance instead of just having to come to your pocket. But if you do want it to come straight to your um, bank account, you can, because that's your money. You can use it on whatever you want to. But if you're trying to pay off your um, student loans and your, your balance, definitely have them put it towards your balance. Okay, so sources of financial aid. So the financial aid comes um, from a variety, a variety of different sources. So we have the federal government, which is the U.S. Department of Education. And then we have the state government, which is ISAC, Illinois Student Assistance Commission. And then the colleges that you um, might go to in the future, they offer institutional aid. So they offer scholarships and grants that you can apply for. And then you have outside and private sources as well. So those are different corporations or organizations or businesses that might offer scholarships for you. So definitely um, check out different sources of financial aid because there's plenty out there. Okay, so these are the must get to know financial aid sources. So we have Illinois Student Assistance Com Commission, and then that's um, ISAC, um, the HC in Illinois is that administers state scholarships, grants, prepaid tuition. Like I said earlier, it was created in 1957 by the General Assembly. And then we have the U.S. Department of Education. So this is like the big one. This is the federal government. So this is the one um, we recommend both of these. Um, so these are the ones that we recommend students um, take out the most with because the other ones are usually private loans and we don't recommend private loans as much if you don't need them. Okay, so right here we have your big grants. So for the maximum award amounts for 2021 school year, we have the MAP grant, which is um, administered by ISAC. Um, it is up to $5,340,000 this year. 
And then we have our Pell Grant, which is up to $6,345. The Pell Grant is um, the federal government grant. And for, with both of those together, you can potentially get $11,685. So that's why we um, always advise students to um, apply for FAFSA even if they feel like they're not going to get that much money back because you never know but even if you don't get the whole amount you can get part of the grants so just like just try it. you never know how much you can possibly get back because eleven thousand dollars is a big chunk of money for a school year so um, i always say you might as well try to see how much you'll get back and for the map grant um they'll pay your tuition and fees and then for the Pell grant they'll, they'll pay your tuition fees plus like room and board and other miscellaneous expenses that you can use it towards okay so right here we have the illinois student assistance commission so this is a um, minority award the uh, monetary award program which is the map program that i was just talking about it is up to five thousand three hundred and forty dollars for this school year coming up and then we have the Illinois Veterans Grant, which we call the IVG. They pay the tuition and mandatory fees. And then we have the Illinois National Guard Grant, which is called the ING tuition, and they pay the tuition and mandatory fees as well. Um, they are covered by um, the public schools, the 12 big public schools in, um, the, uh, in Illinois. So the, uh, the public universities in Illinois, you can use these grants at, and they'll pay your tuition and mandatory fees for your graduate or undergrad school year. And then we have the grant for dependence of police, fire, and correctional officers. So this will go to dependence of um, the officer that has died or uh, has gotten hurt up to 9%. And then they'll, pay, they'll get their tuition and mentoring fees paid as well. And then we have our teaching program for this school year. We have the Minority Teachers of Illinois Scholarship, which is called the MTI. Um, it is up to $5,000 this year. Um, this is a grant to motivate minority students to go on and become teachers. So for students that are African American, Asian American, Hispanic American, Native American, Native American. Um, so, and also be aware that this does have a teaching requirement as well. So you must teach within one year after graduating. And then we have the special education tuition, teacher tuition waiver, which is called SETTW. There is no annual or minimum amount that you can possibly get. Um, so for this one, there's a teaching requirement as well. And if you don't um, do the teaching requirement, both of these teaching programs can become a loan at 5%. So it's really important if you do do these programs to actually complete the agreement for the um, teaching program. So you want to pay back a loan at 5%. So here are the US Department of Education um, federal grant programs. We have the federal Pell Grant, which I was talking about earlier a little bit. It is up to $6,348.45. And um, they pay your tuition and fees and miscellaneous expenses as well. Um, and then we have the Iraq and Afghanistan service grant, which is up to $5,970 right now. So um, um, this is for people that have died in Iraq and Af in Afghanistan after 9-11. And then we have um, our TEACH grant, which is up to $3,764 right now. So this is another teaching agreement. So you will have to teach in a designated school area after um, graduating. So just be aware for this program. This is um, um, from the US Department of Education. So if you're interested in any of these, definitely check out their websites um, just to know a little bit more information about them. And then they have some camp campus-based um, programs. So we have the Federal Supplemental Education Opportunity Grant which is $100 to um, $4,000. So um, the school decides how much money you'll get. So this is like based on need base. So if they see that you need additional funds, they can give you up to $4,000 to help you out. And then we have the federal work study, which I talked about earlier, and um, the colleges determine the annual minimum or maximum amount. Um, for me, I got $1,500 for each semester. So they split it up um, between the whole semester. So I had around like eight hours of work I had to do each week just to get to that $1,500. Okay, so loan programs. When evaluating loans, options, consider the following. 
Um, so you need to know the source of your loan. It is so important because some so many people graduate college without knowing what loan um, they took out and who to contact, who to pay back. So it's very important to know your loan right away. So definitely make sure you write down everything, keep all the information you can and try not to lose anything just so you're aware of what loans you have. And then we have the interest rate. You need to know the interest rate for your um, loan. Like, are they variable or they're... Um, are there a fixed interest rate is very important to know because you don't want to um, have to pay back so much money and not know why. So that's why that's definitely ask about interest rate. And then we have um, subsidized versus uh, subsidized loan. Um, this is given to you by the federal government. We'll talk about this one a little bit later. And then we have repayment options and grace period. So you need to know what options um, your loan has for repayment options and do they have grace periods for, for how long you can go without paying back the loan. Um, for the federal government, they have a lot of different um, repayment options. They have some based off how much money you make. They have some for when you need to stop paying on a loan for a, a moment called deferment. So if you're not able to pay, they can put you on deferment, which is not, um, you won't have to pay any interest on that, but you have to have a special circumstance, of course. So definitely, if you do take out loans, I recommend the federal government just because they have so many different repayment options and they do give you a grace period. Okay, so subsidized versus unsubsidized. So to understand the difference between the two, um, you need to consider when interest will begin to occur. So for direct subsidized loans, it is need-based. The interest is paid by the federal government or and while a student is in school at least half time and during grace periods and during deferments. So it's so important um, to know what the loan is about and what it does. And so then we have direct unsubsidized, unsubsidized loan. We call this the unhappy loan just because it is not need-based and a student is always responsible for paying the interest. Um, for me, I try to remember these um, both of these loans by, um, if I have like $1,000 for a subsidized loan, if I have $1,000 subsidized loan, um, when I'm a freshman, the loan will stay the same until I graduate. So if I have that $1,000 as a freshman, when I become a senior, it will still be $1,000. But but for um, direct unsubsidized loans, if I have $1,000, it will not be $1,000 when I graduate, it will be a lot more because the interest started when I first took out, the, when I started school. So the interest will be um, the interest will be the same fixed, but the amount of money I owe back will be more. So the thousand dollars will not be a thousand dollars anymore. It'll be more than a thousand dollars. Okay, so federal loan programs for 2021 school year. So we have our direct subsidized loan, which is need based, like I said earlier, it is at a 2.75 fixed interest rate, and the grace period is six months. And then we have the direct unsubsidized um, loan. It is not need-based and the fixed rate is 2.75% and the grace period is six months as well. So as you can see, both of the fixed rates are the interest rates are the same and they both are fixed, but one is um, need-based and one is not need-based. And then we have direct unsubsidized loan, which, for, which is for a graduate student. Um, it is not need-based and it is at a fixed rate, but the interest rate is higher at 4.30%, but you still get the six months grace period. And then we have our direct plus loan, which a parent or a graduate student can take out. It is unsubsidized and it is credit-based, so you will have to apply for this loan to see if you qualify for it. Um, the interest rate is at 5.30% and it is fixed at that amount, but the repayment starts within 60 days. We do not recommend the Parent PLUS loan just because it is at a higher interest rate and then the payment starts right away and the interest starts right away. But you can, um, if you do take out Parent PLUS loan, you don't have to pay it back within the 60 um, days. You can start paying it back um, later on, but you will have to request it to be um, paid after the student graduate. But if you don't take out a parent plus loan, I don't recommend it because you might have like another student that you might need to take out the loan for. If you have like three students that you're taking out a parent plus loan for, it can become a lot of money. So definitely um, just weigh out all your options before you take out the parent plus loan. Okay, so the maximum direct loan amounts 
Okay, so for the first years, first year in college, you will get a maximum amount of 5,500. So the maximum of subsidized loans you'll get is 3,500. For an independent student, you can get up to $9,500 for that school year. But as you can see, the um, subsidized stay the same for both dependent and independent student at $3,500. And then you, for your second year, it does go up a little bit. So for dependents, it goes up to $6,500. So that's what the student will get for that school year. And then you have the independent student, um, they will get up to $10,500 for that school year. But again, for the max amount of subsidized, it stays the same for both students. And then we have um, for third year and beyond, um, for independent students, we have 7,500. And then for independent, we have 12,500. And then um, for the max amount of subsidized, we have 5,500 for both independent and independent. And for graduate or professional school, um, you're not considered a dependent student anymore. You're considered an independent. So you'll get $20,500. So, but that's only an unsubsidized loan. So once you become go to graduate school or professional schools, you will just get $20,000, $20,500 for unsubsidized loans for that school year. So um, if I were to go back to school for my master's, um, I would get $20,500 for in unsubsidized loans, but I wouldn't get any other grants or anything else. I would just get the unsubsidized loans unless I was able to get like scholarships, of course. Okay, so how to apply for financial aid. So to be considered for a student aid, a student must complete all forms required by a college. Um, it is important to communicate with each college to find out what is required for a complete application. So. Um, we recommend that you do the FAFSA or the alternative application depending on your situation and who you are. Um, for the alternative application, it does have a uh, pre-screening to let you know if you need to do the FAFSA or the alternative application. The alternative application is new this year. They just, um, it just started January 1st of this year. And then it's important to complete other forms that schools may ask for. So whether that's scholarships that you need to apply for or just finishing out your applications or anything else like that. Okay, so this is what the FAFSA website looks like. It should not look like anything else. So this is your first stop to um, completing your financial aid. It is used to apply for state and federal um, financial aid programs. So this is what it looks like. When you go to the website, you should not have to pay for anything. If you see something where you have to pay for financial aid or um, just doing the website in general, you're on the web wrong website. So leave that and make sure you go to the right website. And um, it's important to complete the FAFSA because even if you don't um, get financial aid back, a lot of times colleges want you to still complete it in order for them to offer any grants or scholarships to you because they want to see that you exhausted all your other aid money sources. And then the application is not, it is at no cost, like I said. And um, this is your first stop to the whole financial aid process. So this is what it looks like. And right here we have the alternative application for Illinois. So um, ISAC created this application. This application is only for state aid. So this will be your MAP grant. It is open to qualifying undocumented students and transgender students who are not eligible to complete the FAFSA. Um, some colleges use it to award institutional aid, so um, students might have to complete this in order to get institutional aid as well, just like the FAFSA. And this application is at, at no cost as well. And if you are confused on um, if you should do the FAFSA or this, again, um, the alternative application has a pre-screening to let you know if you need to complete the alternative application or the FAFSA. So most time people are only doing the FAFSA. Okay, so for the 2021-22 school year, um, you should do the FAFSA as soon as possible after after October 1st. So both the alternative application and the FAFSA, um, it opens up October 1st. So you can check with your college, colleges for other dates and deadlines if they want you to complete by a certain time. It's important, it's important to actually talk to them too because they might want to do that at a different date. And then who should be doing it? High school seniors and college students. And then how you can either go to FAFSA.gov or if you qualify for the alternative application, go to www.isec.org slash alternative app. And then why? Um, 
Both of them determines eligibility for federal and state aid programs. Some institutions use these to award institutional aid. Okay, so for parents' information, most um, students must report parental information until age 24. For financial aid purposes, there are only three types of parents, biological parents, adoptive parents, and step parents. If you are married to the biological parent, no one else should be providing information on the FAFSA or alternative application. So if you have a legal guardian, they are not considered parents for purposes of the FAFSA. So the student will more than likely be considered independent if they have a legal, legal guardian. If parents are divorced, report information about the parent the student lived with most in the past 12 months. So um, a lot of parents um, might have a hard time with this one because a lot of times they say like, oh, well, they we stay with my students stay with me full um both equally so it's important to see who the student actually stays with and who which parent provides more financially for that student and then if you have a hard time trying to determine which one's the answer you could ask me or alexis your core member at round lake so definitely have any questions ask us so we can help you make the best decision okay information needed so for the fafsa only you'll need your social security number and parents who do not have a social security number number must enter all zeros um, you'll need your um, alien registration number if the student is not a u.s citizen and you'll need your federal student aid which is your fsa id to sign electronically so at the end of the fafsa you'll need to sign um sign it sign it and that'll be called your fsa id and then for your FAFSA and alternative application, for both of these, you'll need your 2019 federal tax returns, W-2s, and other records of income. You'll need your banking statements and records of investments, if you have any, and records of, of untaxed income. And then you'll need a list of colleges um, the student would like to attend. So for the FAFSA and alternative application, um, the student can list up to 10 schools with it. But if the student has more schools they want to add, they can always go back on later, like after a week to add more schools onto it. And then um, if you do the paper form for FAFSA, because there is a paper form for the FAFSA, you can only put up to four schools. But I recommend doing the um, the online form because it's, a little, it's way easier than doing the paper one. Then you can add more schools on it as well. So for your electronic signatures for both. So for FAFSA, uh, an FSA ID is needed to sign the FAFSA electronically. So um, this is usually the first step to doing your FAFSA. You should make your FSA ID one parent and um, the student will have to create one in order to submit your FAFSA. Um, students and parents must each have their own. So you can't share one. Each of you guys must have your own. And the FSA ID is needed to renew the FAFSA every year. And note, parents who do not have a social security number cannot obtain an FSA ID. So if you don't have a, um, a, a social security number, um, don't be alarmed. You can still sign. They have a signature page at the end of the application. So they'll let you know, oh, you can print this page out and then send it to this address. And then we have the alternative application. You will need a pen, a pen is needed to sign the alternative application electronically. Students and parents must have their own PIN. Um, the PIN will generate and, sent and be sent via email by ISAC. A PIN is needed every time you renew your alternative application. And, and, and to obtain a PIN, parents only need to provide an email. So it's a little bit different than the FAFSA. Okay, so right here we have our IRS data retrieval tool. This allows, the trans to, allows you to transfer um, your tax information to the FAFSA. So first, when you when you get to the um, to taxes part, you'll see the first picture, which is the IRS data retrieval tool. It will say link to the IRS. Some people will not get this, but when it says this, you're able to press link to the IRS, and then you'll get to the next page and it'll say look up tax information. It'll have you fill in like your address, your name, any information that it might need. And then it will allow you to transfer over your information to the FAFSA. So this is the faster way of getting your information on the um, FAFSA, and this is it just it makes it more easier. But some people will not be um, able to do this. Like if you're if you're married and you file separately, you will not qualify for the IRS data retrieval tool. So it all depends on how you file your taxes, whether you 
be um, able to link it to the IRS or sometimes it could be like um, your address might be different now than it was on your taxes so you might not qualify to do the um, to link your IRS tax forms to the FAFSA but if not um, don't be alarmed because you can just put everything in manually and it walks you through, through everything it lets you know what line to look on your taxes for so um, it's not something to be like nervous about Okay, so expected family contribution, which is called your EFC, um, the FAFSA and the alternative application will generate a number called the EFC. So what is it? Um, it is the amount a student and family can be expected to contribute in one academic year. And why does it matter? It is used to determine a student's eligibility for most federal and, and state programs. So this is a number that you'll see after you complete your FAFSA or if you complete your alternative application, it'll tell you like a number. So right here we have verification. This is the process used by schools to confirm that data uh, reported on the FAFSA or alternative application is accurate. So schools use this to make sure everything is accurate on your form. Uh, if you are selected for verification, you may be asked to submit additional information. So like such as tax return, transcripts, W-2s, inf income information, list of members of the household. So they might ask a bunch of different questions that you, um, you might need to answer. I was selected for verification. It wasn't a big deal at all. They just wanted to know my household size because it might've seemed weird on the FAFSA when I completed it. So they just wanted to verify everything was correct. Um, it is a common process, so a lot of people get called for it. I was called for verification every year because I just want to verify everything was correct. And it's important to only provide um, information that they ask for. Do not give them more than they ask for because then it gets confusing. So if they ask for one form, just give them that. Don't, don't give them anything extra. And make sure you submit all documents on time. Okay, so how much does college cost? So. Tuition and fees is considered a direct expense. So this is an expense that you, you must pay. It's whatever the college costs and their fees cost. Then we have the room and board. So this can be direct or indirect expense, depending on where you stay at, because a lot of times you might stay on campus, but some students might stay um, off campus in an apartment or stay with roommates. So the, the price could fluctuate some. So that can be indirect or direct expense. And then we have transportation that's considered an indirect expense because you got to think, do I have a car? Do I have to pay for gas? Do I take the bus home or do I fly um, across the country to get home? So that can be either higher or lower depending on you personally. And then you have books and supplies that can be an indirect expense as well because you can get books from a bookstore, you can share books, you can buy books from your friends, rent books. So the price can vary. Um, you can get books from your library, which can be free. So it's definitely can be an indirect um, expense because it can be higher or lower depending on where you get your books and supplies from. And then you have your mis miscellaneous living expenses. So that can be like buying clothes, getting food, getting your hair done. It all depends on you. And if you um, spend extra money on other things. So all this can be considered an indirect expense that you can either make higher or lower depending on you. And all this is considered the cost of attendance. Um, right here, um, we have financial need. So how much aid can a student receive? So the schools use this calculation to, to determine your financial needs. So they do the cost of attendance minus suspected family contribution. Contribution um, equals your financial need. So right here, we have three examples. We have college A, college B, and college C. Uh, for college A, we'll say that's a community college, and college B, we'll say that's a public um, university, and then for college C, we'll say that's a private school. So for the cost of tenants, you can see it, it get um, it's cheaper at a community college, then it goes up a little bit for the public university, and then for the private school, it's about $35,000, so it's way more than the um, other schools, but for your EFC, you can see it stayed the same at each school. So your expected contribution is 3000 So that stayed the same no matter what school you went to. But your financial need changed. So for each school, you needed more, you might have needed more money because <clears throat> the school was more expensive. So for the private school, 
um, they expect your financial need to be 32,000 because it's a higher school and your expected family contribution is only 3,000. Um, 3, so for private schools, um, it may seem like scary with that number with private schools, but don't count them out because a lot of private schools offer grants and scholarships that might end up being cheaper than a public school. Um, my cousin actually went to a private school and it was way cheaper for him to go there instead of a public university because he was offered a full ride. So definitely if you have a dream to go to a private school, check out the school and ask them, do they help with um, financial aid? And if they offer any scholarships or grants that you can apply for, because it can help uh, a tremendous amount. Okay, so financial aid offers. The financial aid administers at the college will package all available aid and send a financial aid offer for, consider for consideration. Um, you can use our ISAC financial aid comparison worksheet on our website at studentportal.isac.org slash financial fine aid to make an informed decision. So we have this um, form where you can actually uh, put your school's financial aid package on there. So it will actually like what type of loans you got, scholarships and everything and all the amounts you can add on to there. So you can actually see how much money you um, you might have to pay for that school or how much loans you have, you have to take out for that school. It just makes you really think and compare schools. So it's um, very helpful. And they have a paper form and an online form that you can do to help you with picking out the school that's best um, for you financially. When you're looking at your financial aid offers, you should think about what is the total cost of attendance, or what is the student's financial aid eligibility, what's financial need met at that school, what is the expected family contribution, and what types of financial aid are included, um, what is the out-of-pocket cost. So these are all important questions to ask yourself when you're looking at your financial aid offers because you don't want to go to a school if they don't offer you a, a lot of financial aid and you're paying so much out-of-pocket. So but it's all your choice in the end, so you need to make sure you pick a school that you like and that's affordable for you because school can be expensive, so it's important to pick um, a school that's best for you. So here are some FAFSA tips and reminders. It's important to complete the FAFSA and the alternative application ASAP after October 1st. So either or, you do not complete both the FAFSA and the alternative application. And then information reported on the FAFSA is confidential and only used to determine financial aid eligibility. And you may be asked to submit documentations to the financial aid office for verification purposes. So again, don't be alarmed if you get called for verification. They're just trying to verify that the information is correct. And supplemental applications or forms may be required. So the school might ask for additional um, forms to be signed for your application. So make sure you get all that done. Make sure you keep track of the application deadlines because if you miss deadlines, you might miss out on money or just get into the school that you want to get into. So it's important to pay attention to those deadlines. Um, make sure you keep a copy of everything you submit. I had a box where I kept all my papers that I had throughout college and it really came in handy for every year. I needed to look in that box for different forms to make sure I had it and it helped for the next year when I asked for it. And you must reapply every school year. So every year you're going to college, you need to reapply for either the FAFSA or the, or the alternative application. So the FAFSA is for federal student aid and state aid, and then the alternative application is for only state aid. So the financial aid process. Um, it's important to complete the FAFSA or the alternative application, not both. Make sure you review the, um, the, the application data um, complete verification, but only if you're selected, of course. Receive and review financial aid offers, so make sure you review it, um, all the offers you get, and make sure you respond to your colleges and universities. A lot of times, um, students don't respond to the universities, universities and just go to one, but it's important to let them know if you're going or not because you could be holding out aid for another student. So make sure you tell the school um, yes or no. Make sure if you don't want to go to that school, make sure you tell, um, send them a nice like um, letter, tell them no, thank you and everything. So just make sure you respond to them so they're not holding out aid for another student that might want to go to that school but can't because they don't have the financial um, aid that they need to go to that school. And make sure to complete all pending processes. So on your student portal for school, make sure everything is done. 
and um, make sure everything's completed um, before you go to school so it won't be a hassle when you go to your first day of school and make sure you review and uh, renew your FAFSA or alternative application every year um, while you're going to school. So here's our ISAC student portal. Uh, on the here we have a, a lot of games and just a lot of college help um, information that you can find on here. We have our um, College Greenlight, which we are partnered with. It is a college and scholarship search. So if you're looking, having a hard time looking for um, a college, you can go to College Greenlight and you create a portfolio and they'll match you with certain colleges that um, you might like. And then you can apply for scholarships on there as well. Um, it's, it's a very helpful website. Um, you can start applying for scholarships on there right now. They have, um, you can start and you could have started in ninth grade on this website. So it's a very nice website to get students to start applying for scholarships earlier on. And then we have um, a financial aid calculator where you can see how much financial aid you might be getting from when you get your um, financial aid um, package and then have financial aid games as well. And then we have money, money management games such as Claim Your Future, which helps you um, basically claim your future. It's a game and you can just play around with it to see how much stuff is in the real world. And then we have um, another uh, organization that we are partnered with called Eleanor WorkNet Center. They have careers and jobs and internships on their website. So if you're looking for anything like that, you can definitely check them out. They, they um, also have surveys on their website as well where they can help you find out your likes and dislikes. I have actually played a few of the um, surveys, survey games to see what, what my likes or dislikes are. So it really helps if you're kind of confused on what you want to go to college for at this time. So definitely check it out. And then they have college planning tips as well. So they have like a checklist for each grade level. Um, it lets you know what you need to have done for each year of your grade level for college just to keep you on track. And so here are your trusted websites, learn what you need to know and stay up to date with accurate and trusted sources of information. So we have the studentportal.isac.org. So that's what I was just talking about with the ISAC student portal where we have like different games and um, hopeful things for college on there. And then we have the studentaid.gov website, which is the federal government website. And then we have fasta.gov where you'll do your actual FAFSA at and complete that at. And then we have um, isac.org slash alternative app. Um, this is where the alternative application is at, where you can do that if you um, are completing the alternative application. So um, these are the trust, trust their websites. So make sure when you're doing your financial aid, you go to one of these websites. So if you have questions about financial aid or questions about going to college, you can text our experts. Um, you can pick the area code that's closest to you. Um, for us, it will be the 847 number, so please feel free to take a picture of this. Um, if you're a parent or a student, you can text the number. They'll ask you your name, um, and if you're a student or a parent, then you'll let them know, and um, you can ask them any questions about the college going process or financial aid, and they will get back to you. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me or call me or text me, um, and I'll be here to help you if you need any, anything. And also you can um, talk to your core member here around like Alexis as well, but feel free to contact me too. And I am complete. Thank you guys so much. Well, thank you so much, Sierra. We do have um, a bunch of questions that we are gonna get through. I just wanted to highlight some of the um, call outs that you gave during the presentation that I think are super important and then we will get to some of the uh, answers. So for the uh, FAFSA versus the alternative application, uh, I know Sierra said it multiple times, but I just want to be very clear. If the student is a legal U.S. citizen, they can complete the FAFSA even if their parent is not a legal U.S. citizen. You do not need to create, you do not need to apply for the alternative app if your parents or your guardians are not legal citizens, as long as the student is a legal U.S. citizen and has a social security number, the student can apply for the FAFSA. Like Sierra said, at the end, the parent might not, or a guardian may not be able to get um, an FSA ID, but it's a very simple form that you just sign at the bottom. You print it out, you sign it, and you mail it in, and then it will make its way to uh, the FAFSA system, and then it will be go through. So please don't be dissuaded into doing that. Um, also for the FSA ID, if both parent and student or parent guardian and student are legal citizens, you both must create an ID. It's not one ID 
for one, it's one ID for one and one ID for the other. So two IDs will be created, one for each person. If you have uh, multiple parents, you don't need to create multiple accounts for the parents or the guardians, just one. I wanna be clear about that. Um, verification happens. It happens to almost everybody. It's not, it's not rare. I just wanna be very clear. And I, Sierra, thank you for giving us the example of what happened to you, because it could be just as minimal as how many people do you have in your house? And the form is not very hard. Some forms are gonna be a little bit trickier. They're gonna ask you for more specifics. If you fill out the FAFSA and you put something in about how much your family makes when you're filling out the, um, the IRS tax documents and it doesn't line up, they're gonna ask you to give them more proof. They'll ask you to sometimes uh, take a scan or a photocopy of a, an actual tax form page and send it to them. But it's absolutely doable. Anything they ask is doable. You just need to partner with counseling team and there's a whole bunch of uh, outside resources that are coming in this year. ISAC, we have CLC, we have um, just a whole bunch of people that are gonna be helping. So you will have the, uh, the means to get to the end for this. And then finally, you have to reapply every single year. So do not think because you've applied for the FAFSA this year, um, after October 1st, you don't have to do it every year. Every year that you are in college, you need to move forward with creating, uh, to filling out the FAFSA. And so, Sierra, one of the first questions I want to ask, and I, mm -hmm. I know the answer, but I want you to ask, answer this. So, Sierra, if you had a brother or a sister and you were going into your freshman year and your brother and sister were going into their junior year, how many FAFSAs do your parents have to fill out? Oh, so they have to do one for me and one for my, and one for each student, basically. That's <laughs> right, but... She said. If they you they only need to create one FSA ID yeah. for themselves. Yeah, one FSA and then, ID. And what happens so you to use all that same of the inform Yep, what happens to all the information that they put in on the FSA ID? Oh, a state. Well, they'll put in the same information. So for each student, yep. you put in the same informa information depending on of course if your own information changed over the years, like taxes and stuff, that'll be different. But yep. you'll put in your information on with each application you do for your students. The only thing that changes is if, the, if your sophomore or junior student has a job and they're making money and your freshman student has a job or doesn't and they're not making money, the student side will change. You'll want to make sure you're giving an accurate amount of money that they're making through their taxes. But otherwise, it's pretty simple. If, you have, if you're lucky enough to have two, I mean, it's expensive to have two kids mm -hmm. in college at the same time, but you don't have to worry about doing the FAFSA for eight years straight if you have back-to-back -back kids in uh, Yeah, and then the once EFC you do the can be different. Once, yeah, yeah. Once you do the FAFSA, it becomes much easier the second year. So, and then the expected family contribution can be different for each student, depending if like they worked or not, or depending okay. on what year um, you do that. You do the um, financial aid for that student because you might have made more this year or made less the last year, so they might have a di different expected family contribution. And the financial need could be different also because if student yeah, yep. A is going to a private school and student B is going to a community college the financial need could be different because of the cost of attendance. Keep that in mind. Um, let's go through some of the questions I have on here. So Sierra was uh, kind enough to show her information. I am going to um, pull up my screen right now and I'm going to show you, uh, can you see our friend Alexis on the screen right now, Sierra? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. So this is Alexis Alvarez. He is our actual ISAC rep. Sierra works mostly with Zion and CLC, and she's happy to help you because our ISAC reps are excellent. Um, but Alexis is the person that we directly go through. So if you do have any questions, you can feel free to go directly to Alexis for any um, questions there. I'm also going to put Alexis's information right here. You are going to see at the bottom of the chat feature, everyone, it says his name, his phone number, his email address, and then there's a link to You Can Book Me. I am going to be sending all of this information, including a copy of this uh, webinar, which is being recorded, to the parent and guardian and student email addresses. With Alexis's You Can Book Me. You can click that link, and you can actually schedule an appointment with Alexis where you can talk about uh, FAFSA, you can talk about the financial aid process. Once FAFSA opens in October, Alexis would be very, very happy to actually walk step by step with you through the um, FAFSA process. So it's going to be really great. And this is going to be one of the big tools we have to help our families getting through the process this year. So there's two ways you can reach out. You can reach out directly to Alexis or you can reach out to our awesome friend Sierra here also. 
The next question that came up was, what amount of income determines need base? And I think that you did a great job talking about that on one of your slides. It is cost of attendance minus expected family contribution, and that equals financial need. So that's where need base comes. If you have a family where you're making $100,000, $150,000 between two parents, the needs base, the financial needs, is going to be much less than a family that has uh, one or two students in school and the family's making $45,000, $50,000 a year. That financial need changes, but it also changes depending on what school you're going to. I can pretty confidently say that um, most of our students who want to attend our community college, if you want to attend CLC, um, it's very uh, rare that students have to pay much out of pocket for attending CLC. It does happen. Please know that anything can happen, but ma the majority of our students that go to CLC um, that fall into this financial need category will be able to go to CLC with the MAP and the Palm Branch for free, if not very, very close to free. So that's why a lot of our kids do move that route, just for that savings of two years at CLC, two years at a, a four-year college, they get their undergrad classes out of the way, their gen eds, and they save a lot of money. So it varies on what um, determines the needs base. What you're gonna get from schools varies. Um, but when you fill out the FAFSA, at the end of the FAFSA, when you put all your information and all your students' information in, it will tell you what your EFC is, what your expected family contribution. It will give you that number at the end so you have a place to go from. And then when you start applying to schools and you get accepted to schools, schools will send you financial aid packages in the mail. Those traditionally come uh, March, April. They'll send you a packet in the mail and it will be many, many pages long and it will go through a million things and at the very end, just like when you buy a car, it will have a number that shows you what they're expecting you to pay. It will tell you how you can pay it off, what kind of loans you can take, what kind of scholarships, grants your students accepted or could accept, and then it will tell you the amount that needs to be paid off from there. Uh, the next question is, what are the requirements to qualify? Um, my parents have not lived in the U.S. for 15 years, and I came back as a U.S. citizen. Can I still apply for aid? Absolutely. Like we said, you can absolutely complete the FSA ID if you were born in the United States and you are a U.S. citizen and have a social security number, or if you were not born in the United States and are a U.S. citizen now with a social security number, you can absolutely apply for FAFSA. If you have any of these specific questions where it's a one-off question or you feel like your situation is um, different, this is the perfect time to reach out to Alexis to sit down and schedule an appointment with him, even if it's virtually, to talk about how your situation looks. And Alexis can give you a lot more detail about how you're gonna work through the FAFSA. You can, again, you can complete the FAFSA with Alexis, um, and then any question that pops up during it uh, can be answered. Where do we get an FSA ID? I did answer that question in the chat as we were moving on. I will send that information out in that email that's gonna be out by the end of the week. Um, I was gonna send it out on Saturday, so be around your computers over the weekend and you'll get an, this video link with some uh, additional support on there. But you can just go to fsaid.ed.gov and it will allow you to create your FSA ID. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you can just go to fafsa.gov and you can also create your FSA ID right there. It'll take you to the um, And again, don't forget, you need one for the student and one for whomever's claiming the student as a dependent or their parent. Does financial aid take into account the number of dependents in college? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> If you have two students in college at the same time, it is going to take into account that you have two students in uh, college at the same time. So you may make the exact same dollar amount as the person next door and they may have uh, one student and you may have two students going to the exact same school. You should expect to get more financial aid opportunities than the person with one student at the same school who makes the same amount. So again, um, there is a formula for everything. You will see though, um, and it don't be, disheartened, but you may hear that your student got into University of Illinois uh, Urbana-Champaign and your friend's student got into University of Illinois-Champaign um, and you're not paying the same amount. It's not that you're not paying the same amount. The tuition and room and board are all flat fees. But they could have applied for more scholarships. They could have gotten more grant money from other funding. They may have had a higher GPA and so they're getting a merit-based scholarship. So at the end of the day, the thing that's most important is focusing on what your students 
um, final number is and if that's something that's doable through loans or if that's something that's not doable. Um, if I only have a legal guardian, will I automatically be marked as independent? Again, that's a really great question to put through to Alexis Alvarez. It doesn't necessarily mean you are automatically gonna be um, put as an independent if your parents are, we, we see a lot of situations. Um, it's, sometimes it gets a little bit confusing if you're a student with a family from divorce or if your parents aren't in the United States anymore, um, but we can find you the answer. There are resources that we can get to. So please just make sure you partner with myself, with um, Alexis, and we'll be able to help you with that. Do you have to be a legal resident? Uh, again, yes. If, in order to complete the FAFSA, um, the student at least needs to be a US citizen. Otherwise, you can. the student can complete the alternative application. That is why the RISE application uh, was created, was for our undocumented students and for our transgendered students. Traditionally, the RISE application, it's only been a year, but it opened in January, which was very confusing since the FAFSA opens October 1st. <laughs> but this year, I heard the feedback from all of us, the ISAC members, the counselors, to please let's have them open at the same time so it's not confusing for our students. And so the RISE application actually still opens up on October 1st, the same exact day as the FAFSA. So you are able to complete that at the same time. Uh, if anybody has any other questions, feel free to type it into the chat box at the bottom. Just make sure you send it to all panelists and we would be happy to answer it. I also want to uh, briefly, can you see that I've changed to the uh, federal student aid button? Yes. Okay, perfect. So if you can see, this is what it looks like in order to create an app as ID. It's very easy. You just create your uh, username, password, confirm, and then you'll continue through and answer some questions. It's gonna ask you for um, an email address is going to ask you for a phone number so that way you can text you later for your student. Uh, I would highly recommend using a email address that is not your school email address because in a few years from now or even in a year from now, your student will no longer have a Round Lake High School email address. And so you'll want it to be an email address that's more of a outside uh, professional email address. I recommend students creating that email address if they don't have one anyways at this point. Uh, remember, this is an email address that's going to be seen by many people if you're giving it to college representatives. So make it appropriate. If my name is James Bruno, which my name is James Bruno, a good email address might be like jamesb at gmail.com. I know it's not that easy. Somebody may have that. But even if it's, you know, jamesb1575, then it's an email address that's easily manageable. It's not like coolest dude in the entire world at gmail.com, which it's true, but should not be my email address. So. And then, um, shameless plug for another event that's coming up this week. Uh, on Thursday, we are going to have a virtual college panel starting at 4 p.m. It's gonna be the first of three virtual college panels and students and parents are both more than, and guardians and friends and families and cousins. If you know somebody from a different school, Sierra, I tell the people at Zion, I've sent all the counselors an email. Anybody can jump on. It's gonna be a webinar format just like this where you can ask questions in the chat. But we're gonna have representatives from the University of Illinois Springfield, CLC, Aurora, University of Wisconsin Whitewater, and Northern Illinois University who are gonna be on. They're gonna give a quick presentation, five, 10 minute presentation each about their school. And then we'll open up question and answer at the end so students can actually meet with these representatives and ask questions um, and hear about the schools. Uh, and it's nice because you get to hear from multiple schools at the exact same time instead of having to attend a bunch of individual visits. So we'll be doing this once a month for the next three months. We have a lot of really great schools on the list. You're going to have UIC, uh, University of Illinois Urbana, University of Iowa. We got a whole bunch of really, really, really cool schools coming up. So um, I have sent this link out multiple times now. So just make sure you jump on at 4 p.m. on Thursday. Again, it will be recorded. So if you can't watch it the day of, I will be happy to send it out um, as a video with the link. And so you do not need to sign up for the panels. The reason that I went forward and made all of these webinars into webinars is so that way you can just jump on um, and spend as much time as possible in it. Start from the beginning, go to the end. But if you can only make it for a little bit, you can jump in at any time. And again, I opened it up completely to the public. So 
I'm, I know that it sounds like I'm joking around, but seriously, if you have a friend that goes to, or a family that goes to school down south and they wanna jump into this, it's gonna be relevant information for everybody. These representatives are gonna talk about their school and um, they're more than welcome to come in and ask questions. I want this to be a, a resource for everyone. If we're putting all this work in, then let's get as many people as possible on board, right? Sierra, the more people that come yes. to this event, the last time you have to do them over and over again. This is true. <laughs> right, so thank you so much. I know that um, we are just about 15 days, 16 days away from the FAFSA opening up and there's gonna be a lot of questions that are gonna come up from families mm -hmm. as we get closer to the FAFSA and as the FAFSA opens. So again, I would recommend, please make sure you are reaching out um, to your counselor, to myself as the college and career counselor, mm -hmm. to our ISAC representative, Alexis, his information again is in the corner. I will send this video out on uh, over the weekend with some uh, more contact information on there. And you will be supported throughout this process. We are here for you, even in a virtual format. We are very um, excited about some of the things that we have been working on for the last few weeks here to make everybody's journey through the FAFSA and the college presentation much easier. So since there are no more questions, Sierra, I want to thank you so, so much for your time. I know it's late and you're busy, so thank you for coming and doing this for us? Of course. All right. Well, I'm going to stop the recording and everything now. So everybody have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Again, please feel free to reach out. Thanks, Sierra. Thanks so much, All everybody. Right. Have a good night. Have a good one. Bye.